the tech world, we have a little bit of a problem right now. As Linus demonstrated in his uh, Intel innovation video in the last couple weeks, it, uh, it basically showed that since 2013, we haven't really seen that much real world performance and sometimes even synthetic performance uh, from the next releases of Intel CPUs. We've just seen that with Kaby Lake CPUs, which besides a slight improvement in video playback, we really are not seeing much of a difference over the last generation 6700Ks uh, 6, versus is the newer generation 7700Ks. So this is a little bit of a problem that we really uh, would like to solve. The solution many would argue is AMD, Intel's main competitor in the x86 market. Thanks to a licensing agreement I'll talk about later, Intel actually has an agreement with AMD to uh, use each other's proprietary technologies without having to sue each other. Until AMD's Ryzen CPUs come out in the next couple of months, Intel really hasn't had a massive competitor for the last say five to 10 years. This isn't entirely AMD's fault and I highly recommend you check out Adore TV's video on why the GPU war is over. He does a great job of explaining why, despite often AMD winning in performance, heat, functionality, uh, you know, features, and all that sort of stuff, uh, often people will shop for the brand that they prefer as opposed to going for the one that's actually the best you know, product for them. So you might be wondering why there isn't another company in the market making x86 CPUs you know, on the high end for gaming and video editing and all that sort of other high end workloads. And I'm going to explain that in this video. It's been a lot of long time uh, researching all of this and uh, hopefully trying to get my facts straight so uh, do check this one out and if you want to know any more detail on the steps to manufacture a CPU and the cost involved do check out the video I did last week on the full cost of making a competitive CPU for Intel and AMD so do check that one out I'll leave a card up above and a link in the description. Beyond the one to three or more billion dollar price tag there's actually a few specific challenges that stand in the way of manufacturing and designing your own high-end competitive CPU. The first issue is definitely Definitely going to be licensing. As I mentioned earlier, Intel and AMD have an agreement that allows them to use each other's proprietary technologies without having to sue each other. The story surrounding this is fascinating and I highly recommend you read the article I've linked in the description down below and I've also linked all my other sources down there too if you want to fact check me or anything else and if you do have any other information regarding any of these points or anything else surrounding the manufacturing and design of CPUs please do leave it in the comments down below. I'm certainly not infallible in this situation so if you have any more information information I'd love to hear from you. So to summarize the article, in 1978 Intel created the 16-bit instruction set now known as x86 to go along with our 8086 CPU. That instruction set is commonly known as i386 and you might have seen that in the folders of your driver installers and that sort of thing. Although in 2003 AMD beat them to 64 bits with their K8 series Opteron processors which are the first to run the now standard x86-64 bit instruction set. That's also known as AMD 64 and you'll also probably have seen that in your driver driver installs. Intel has a patent on the microcode design for x86 and is known as the 338 patent and boy have they been sued a lot for it. AMD sued them in 1987 and Intel countersued in the 1990s ending in a settlement with AMD basically getting the full uh, licensing agreement that they have and use to this date. The reason that this is so important is that other companies like Cyrix, a now bought out and defunct company, sued Intel over the patent too. They are what AMD is now which is fabulous so they don't manufacture their own CPUs. They paid people like Texas Instruments and SGS Thompson and later IBM to manufacture them for them. Since all of those companies held existing licenses with Intel, the court decided there was no issue with using Intel's IP to design the chips as long as the manufacturers actually held a, a cross-licensing agreement with Intel. This of course is brilliant for any newcomers to the market and sounds like it's a, a great way to get around the very tedious issues of licensing, but unfortunately it isn't quite that simple. The problem you might face with this though is uh, something that a company called Transmeta found out in the real world in the early 2000s, which is that the manufacturers will likely want a profit share agreement along with a cash payment to actually manufacture the chips for you. Transmeta was a company that was quite secretly founded in 1995 with around $288 million in startup capital, and they manufactured x86 CPUs. Early in the year 2000, they showcased their Crusoe CPUs. These were x86 CPUs that were extremely low power, but unfortunately they weren't as as powerful as the current Intel or AMD competition. The Crusoe CPUs are primarily manufactured by IBM who they had a profit share with and they were certainly impressive when it comes to power usage but they were mostly confined to what was especially at the time a very niche market for the low power small form factor type computers. In 2003 they produced the Efficion CPUs which again were fantastic for small low power uh, small form factor computers but at the same time even though being double the power of the Crusoe chips they still 
still were uh, kind of confined into that small category into what was at the time very, very low volume sales. In 2007, 2008, they were bought out by a venture capital firm for uh, actually quite a small amount of money when you consider what they'd achieved and obviously the startup capital they had. But at the same time, they have uh, since stopped producing CPUs, so they are not a current competitor. One of the other issues you might face when trying to design a CPU is performance versus efficiency. VIA, a Taiwanese-based company currently manufacturing x86 CPUs, in fact, the only other company in the world at the moment manufacturing x86 CPUs that isn't Intel or AMD, also have this similar problem to Transmeta where they're manufacturing small form factor, low power, uh, extremely efficient uh, chips. These are still x86 CPUs. They're actually quad-core CPUs and feature 64-bit architecture and all that sort of stuff, which is great, but since 2002, they've basically been losing a large amount of money, somewhere in the area of 50 million a year, and they've only had two profitable years, at least as far as I can see anyway, in 2001 and 2002, where they think they had about $202 million in profit, so they are losing a fair bit of money each year, and I don't necessarily know that they will uh, you know, continue sustained operations at this point, so uh, it'll be very interesting to see, but they do fall into that sort of category. The reason that this is the case is that we are so far along the development cycle of silicon CPUs that we're actually almost at the point where silicon CPUs are not a viable option for getting better performance and faster. Of course, you'll likely have heard of Moore's Law, which is a guy who used to work at Intel who sort of said a thing that kind of became a law. But anyway, it's a very interesting thing. And if you haven't read about it, I do recommend that, but overall it's uh, a very interesting place that we're at this far along the development cycle. It's very, very difficult to get to the level where Intel and AMD are currently at, and unless you have experience and expertise in the area of manufacturing these types of CPUs, it's very, very difficult to break into the market without basically just buying a standard chip and very slightly uh, altering the design. Investment would likely need to be in the hundreds of millions, if not billions, just for CPU design alone to create a properly competitive chip and it's likely cheaper just to work on the next material for example carbon nanotubes is often talked about uh, and that sort of thing because we are actually as I said at a point where silicon is almost not a viable option for more performance an interesting comparison to make here is take a guess which one is cheaper to build a CPU which includes the design and uh, you know testing and validation aspects or a space shuttle just, just take a guess which one's cheaper to make. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds. It's probably not that surprising. Uh, it's the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle is cheaper to build than a CPU. Now, of course, uh, I'm talking about a CPU from scratch, so someone a brand new company uh, that works with you know an existing manufacturer, so you don't need to care about the licensing. I'm just talking about you know designing and validating and getting a CPU manufactured that is currently competitive with Intel AMD. It's it's that sort of money. It's cheaper to build a space shuttle and go to space and orbit you know, the Earth and you know take up parts of the International Space Station and all of that than just to build the chip that might go in it. So. Yeah, that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting thing. <laughs> Plus, the manufacturer isn't too much of an issue. Intel's chips are reportedly, at least at the Pentium 4 days, to cost about $40 per chip, and of course sold for about $600, although that doesn't take into account R&D and uh, you know, actually wages and all that sort of stuff that goes into uh, building and running a company, as well as obviously designing and manufacturing the chip. Of course, as the process node shrinks, I would expect it to be a little bit more expensive, but I wouldn't expect it to be more than maybe $50 per chip, so it's still not a massive cost for the bomb cost anyway, although of course the design is definitely the biggest aspect. So to round up, the reason why Intel and AMD don't have competitors, especially on the high end, is due to the licensing agreements, the cost, and the sheer complexity of the chips. I hope that I could help you learn something new today, and of course if I did, please do consider subscribing and sharing the video on tech forums or Reddit or just with anyone that you think might enjoy the video. If you wanted to help out more when buying from Overclockers UK or Amazon, if you use the affiliate links in the description down below, it will help me out, it will support the channel and keep me making these sorts of videos. I really do love making these and it's uh, just awesome to be able to learn all this information and, and then to be able to share it with you guys. And as I said, I really do hope that you're able to learn something new today. If you did enjoy the video and you learned something new, please do hit the like button and leave a comment down below letting me know what you learned and if you enjoyed the video and want to see me make more of these styles of videos. And of course, if I got anything wrong or you just know anything else on this sort of topic, please do leave a comment down below and let me know as well. I'm certainly not infallible on this. Uh, I 
I did try to research and, and get as best a, a, of an understanding as possible. But as I said, if you know anything else, please do let me know down below. I'd love to hear from you. So that's pretty much it. As I said, don't forget to watch the video from last week on the steps to build a CPU. Uh, and again, as I said, if you know anything else, let me know in the comments down below. And otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something new and we'll see you all on Friday.